What up, friends? Welcome to Enjoy the Hostilities. This is a mug with my friend Joe Rogan's face on it. I like to drink out of it. I find it inspiring. Like Joe, if you're listening on Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, uh, you don't see that mug, but just trust me. Um, Last week was a crazy week. Um, We will touch on that a little later because I'd like to freshen it up a little bit around here. Um, Very thankful that people, now the, the podcast listeners have been growing, and that's really cool. The idea that people are driving or at work, fucking skipping out on their work, or uh, jogging or working out or whatever, and listening to my ideas and Mar- mine and Mark's work and stuff is very, very, very cool. Mark was a big podcast guy when we got together, but I'm only just starting to realize the beauty of, of long form, you know, spoken word. Um, sharing of ideas. I'm really starting to understand it now. And so I'm very thankful to you guys that are listening. You YouTube people, what I'm thankful for about you guys is that uh, you've started to... um, uh, First of all, I'm thankful that we have so many people that care at all. That's really amazing. But I'm also really thankful that those people are, are... the bulk of what we have, and that anybody else who's sampling in here is understanding that this is a long-form show. If you want me to just break down, and I do love to do it, how an uppercut or a slip, we got one-minute breakdown somewhere else. So this is a long-form, exploring, um, thinking out loud, trying to look underneath rocks, and, and it's a trial and error. There's a lot of mistakes, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of trying to find our way through plateaus. And if you've been with me, you've seen that there's frustrations when you meet these plateaus, and I'm happy to say I'm sort of on the other side of some of those frustrations right now, where I'm really starting to see things in a new way, and and um, you know, rather than only talk about punches and kicks or rankings or you know, Connor and Khabib or whatever, the undertone of a lot of what we've grown into doing here is exploring life a little bit and thinking how we think, why we think, how we can improve, self-improvement. Those, I don't like the word self-improvement because people imagine Anthony Robinson and I think people like that are fucking weird and (laughs) culty. I'm actually surprised that people like Tony Robbins, like Trump's a president, but Tony Robbins isn't. People like that could be president. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Leader personality. So so I'll I'll quickly touch on the three main topics of today and then I want to talk about that if you'll humor me. Um, Again, like... I'm just so thankful that people have, that we've been, people have welcomed the idea that this is not only a martial arts podcast, but that martial arts carries over to all things and all things carry over to martial arts, much like art, much like music, much like math or science. Like most things are, have society, hip hop, you know, anything, most things have society reflected in them and you can see their thing reflected in society. And that's the area of exploration and the amount of support and encouragement that I've had around that idea has been really thrilling because that's what I'd like to spend the next little bit looking at. Um, but today we're going to use that lens. We're going to look at Derek Lewis versus uh, Daniel Cormier for the UFC heavyweight title in like three weeks, probably, right? Right. Uh, we're planning on trying to go to New York. I haven't figured out how yet, but there are multiple people that have shown an interest in, in you know, doing a variety of different work down there. We're going to look at that fight, the fight itself, which is always one of the most beautiful aspects of it. But also, let's reflect its meaning back on the rest of us, on what it is to buy a lottery ticket or be given one for Christmas and these kinds of ideas. Then we're going to, of course... Look back to Habib and Connor, a beautiful performance by Habib, a lot of weird things. Uh, We'll look at that. And then we'll look ahead to to, uh, John Jones returning to fight Alexander Gustafson in a rematch where the biggest difference between this fight for Jones and any other fight for Jones is the fact that that his certain physiological advantages are matched by by, uh, uh, Alexander Gustafson. So we'll talk about that. I'm hitting those in advance, then we'll screw around a little bit, and the only reason I do that is because in U- on YouTube and many other places, people would like to just grab those chunks, so we try to facilitate that as best we can and see what we can learn from trying to do that. But before we do that, uh, Mark, what was it you had just uh, mentioned? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Tony Robbins uh, yeah. should be the president. So, you know what, like, in hip-hop's been doing this probably longer than most art forms, where... If you have a thing 
and there's somebody doing something really well. There's a beauty of hip hop, and don't trust me, I'm not a hip hop expert, but uh, but I like to observe cool things. The beauty here is that rather than saying I'm awesome. I hate everybody else. They all suck. We say, yeah, sure, I'm pretty awesome. But I think he's a great, a great writer, or he rhymes great, or he writes great, a great hook. I think she's a brilliant singer. Whatever it is, and we bring him in, and you start crossing over within your thing. Then Common says, oh, shit, I could go act, and you know, you start branching off. And what you're doing is. The same thing as mixed martial arts. Boxers are learning to wrestle. Wrestlers are coming into jujitsu tournaments. And you start cross-pollinating it. And all politics was, and all famous people in politics now, is that idea. Um, even on an, our little level, I do spoken word one-man shows. I do a podcast. I host a thing on TV. I sing in a rock band. And i am been invited to to do TED Talks. What would TED Talks do? Well, now you'd have a different world of people checking out your thing, if that matters to you. And that's what politics was for some of those people. So when Anthony Robbins, a motivational speaker, is on Netflix in a documentary, that's what people do now, is they spread around things and they cross-pollinate and they, they sample. The idea of the specialist is powerful, but the specialist must spread out still too. So having absolute mastery or as much of mastery as you can as you can muster in an area is great um, but then you must at least sample and and stick your toe into other things as well because that's the world that we live in right now um, not must because there are people who are just true masters of the thing that they do um, uh, quick story again before we get in and this again if you're w listening to the podcast most of you have welcomed these offshoots and I appreciate that because that's that's the beauty of it but a quick story before we get into our sort of main three topics that will later be chopped out is uh I was at Quintet the which was uh, oh that's the grappling tournament yeah the night before I believe it was Friday night but it might have been Thursday night is that the one uh Josh Barnett and yes. Gordon Ryan yes okay. yes and I think it might have been Thursday night mm, I'm not sure uh but I went it's a very busy week when you're at those fight weeks. So Gordon Ryan will probably fight uh, MMA at some point. But first, he is mastering Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, then Frank Mir, who hasn't been training, but he really wanted to be a part of it, is a generalist now. And so he's going to have a harder time going back to just the specialty of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And yes, Gordon Ryan, look him up. I, was, I did film some of, the, some of his matches. Basically, Quintet was a grappling, sport jiu-jitsu grappling contest where there's five people on each team. We compete. If I submit you, you're out. I, I compete with your next guy. If I submit him, he's out. I compete with the next guy. At any point, nobody submits. We're both out, and the next, and it's a team thing, and it's really cool. It's also owned by Sakuraba. It's owned by Sakuraba, who um, uh, won a couple of matches himself, but his team was eliminated. But it's owned by Sakuraba. It's really cool. Love to be part of it in some way. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, but fuck Gordon Ryan, grapple man, bigger guys, smaller guys, didn't matter. Like, that, that was a thrill. It was a real thrill. And then uh, his training partner, Gary Tonin, is fighting in one championship. Uh, I, if you follow me a lot, you might have heard this, but Professor Danaher did a one-on-one -on -one shoot with me with Gordon Ryan and uh, Gary Tonin as his demos, as he played them like video games and they demoed shit. It was awesome. But, uh, but that's specialty. That's Gordon, that's Gordon Ryan. He's a specialist. Uh, Gary Tonin was a specialist, still is a master of jiu-jitsu, but now has added the other tools and has competed in, in uh, mixed martial arts and will continue to. He has one in Singapore coming up as well. Speaking of which, I'm going to be doing more work for one championship. I'll tell you about that when we take another step and get it, get it done. All right. Uh, three topics this week we want to play with. Let's look at the first one. On, the, uh, on November 4th, is it the 3rd or the 4th? I don't know. The first weekend of November, Derek Lewis will challenge Daniel Cormier for the UFC heavyweight title. Super awesome for many, many reasons. Um, uh, now, bear in mind that... Um, 
I just love these the matchups. I love the the dynamics of the matchups. I love the meaning of the fights and stuff. Um, uh, rankings and those things are not as interesting to me. I find them to be a mechanism, and and I don't find them. They've been. They've appeared to me, you may disagree, but they've appeared to me to be meaningless for many years. So I've kind of disregarded them. So I just look at a fight between a man who cuts to 265 pounds and a man who is a light heavyweight champion. And uh, so on, in this hand is a, is a man who was a light heavyweight champion, was also a heavyweight champion in another, another organization and this one, um, who is brilliantly skilled, a brilliant athlete and a brilliant sportsman and a brilliant martial artist and incredibly talented. In this side is a guy who in every single one of those categories scores lower, um, but is also probably 290 by fight time. And also is um, won his last fight in the final 11 seconds of a fight he was getting shit kicked. And I like that. I like that part of it. I really do. Um, if you're just joining um, this segment, you didn't hear in the long form podcast. I love it if you checked it out. But uh, but I'm always talking about trying to find ways to break through um, break through barriers and plateaus that we have. So I'm often looking at our own ways of examining things and looking for weaknesses in them. And one that I've often done, uh, discussed and looked at, and I've tried to treat in my own disease of study, uh, if that is an, a good uh, analogy, and I don't think it is, but uh, tried to, to treat it is that we have a tendency to categorize things and then just compare those categories. Um, and one of them being power, um, which we see by Derek Lewis in that last fight, we see the flaws of just saying Derek Lewis has incredible power. Now, according to the concept of Derek Lewis has incredible power, when he hits a man late in round three or round four, and it, which he's done in the past and is able to hurt them or drop them, then we go, well, see, he's got crazy power even when he's tired. But the issue is Derek Lewis creates a lot of power, but the key element here is desire and commitment. Now, if I ask Derek Lewis to throw a punch on a machine that measures a punch after I get him to exert the way he'd been exerting that night, it would not score in whatever meaningful way you measure pounds per square inch or whatever. That exhausted Derek Lewis would not hit that hard. But Derek Lewis with this, with this almost inhuman desire and willingness and commitment to throwing that punch, that's the beauty. And so when I'm saying... Derek Lewis, how he how much power does he have? That being our weakness, not because I, I want to criticize how we look at things, or not because I want. It's mainly because I I want you to see what's really special about it, and it isn't some arbitrary score that he was born with, and it isn't something that he can do at any time. What mattered was in that moment his, and when you watch it, you see it. He's exhausted. You ask him to fucking run up a flight of stairs and he probably, he's tell you to go, fuck yourself. My balls are tired. I'm not doing it. <laughs> but, but when you see him when it, in the meaning of that moment and, and he purposefully touched that guy's sternum with the, and he could have done it with his eyes closed because it sort of would have been irrelevant uh, in the sense that when you just, with that true, I will give my life to have this thing land, that's what mattered. That's, the, that's the, the incredible thing about that moment. It's not, oh, man, that guy's doing, you know, it's not the things we say just repeated without, without our appreciation for their truth. Because the things we say are, mm, guys like this is dangerous at any moment, even, even late in the fight. Yeah, not every day, not all the time. You know, what, what mattered, what made that so special was just, it is a lifetime, and he doesn't, by his own account, this may be misdirection, he has, doesn't train at the level of many others, but through repetition, that's going to be one of his biggest punches. So that'll be one of the punches he's thrown most in his life. So his body's learned how to do it. Uh, and on many nights, it'll land, if you, you know, held pads, or you measured it in some capacity, it would hit really hard. But when you desperately, 
every fiber of your brain and your body and your soul, if you, if you subscribe to this concept, needs it to hit, you behave differently. And it's a reflection of that thing that we all say. It's like, you know, there's, like, there's only a minute left. Why don't they just go for it? You know, like, don't we say that every fight? Like, doesn't yeah. everybody say that every fight? Like, aren't we screaming that at the TV in those moments where the fight's almost ending? Yeah, yeah you know? everyone does. We're not, all, we're all screaming that. Max Holloway, Ricardo Lamas. Yeah, well, that, and that, that one is that, just like... You don't have that energy, though. Yeah, yeah, you don't have the energy. And you can't overcome your own body's fatigue. and, and Like, you just can't. The lactic acid yeah. builds up. Like, yeah. you, you're just physically unable yeah. to... Movie, so when he's talking about lactic acid and stuff, we, we just said there's a biochemical reason, physical biochemical uh, challenge to overcome. Just g general fatigue, which is also biological, it's biochemical, uh, uh, but it's also psychological. There's fear. There is resigning yourself to it. That's just thought. That's just brain activity. It's just, it's just um, you know, electrical waves in your brain. You're like, I can't fucking do it. All of those things are all connected. If you weren't really sore, you might not think that. If your body didn't ache, you might believe you could do it. But all of those things make it fucking impossible to do what he did. And when I say impossible, it's like you take a thousand, you watch a thousand fights just like that one, and that won't happen. That's uniquely special. It doesn't so much matter, not to him, not that day, doesn't so much matter who's stronger or faster, or has better cardio, or like has better boxing, or you know is a better wrestler, who's uh, who's got distance management skills. None of that shit matters to Derek Lewis. And if and I'm not trying to say, although his personality tries to imply to us that he's a simple man, you know, hey, fuck, you know, whatever. That may not be true. That might be a personality thing as well. But regardless, there's a decent chance that if I t spoke to that gentleman about shit like distance management and, you know, uh, and um, lactic acid and stuff, he'd go, fuck yourself. I wanted to smash that guy and I landed that punch. And that's real and that matters. That really does matter. Now, does that mean that the things, the way we look at range and, you know, the biomechanics weren't at play? They were at play, but they weren't at play through the, um, examined through the lenses that were examining it. It was at play because that motherfucker wanted to hit that guy with everything he had. And that is... and. It, you might hear me saying, I go, well, yeah, of course he did. But that's different than everybody else. Not that they didn't want to, but they couldn't make themselves do it. They weren't capable of it. When he's, and uh, uh, Mark, do you want to pull up his record? Yeah. He's got finishes in the third and fourth round before. And, I, and you've watched those. You've watched a lot of them. He's fucking tired. Tired people don't do that. Almost ever. And when I say almost ever, I mean, sure, one out of 100 and one out of 90 or one out of 210. That's not that few, statistically speaking, but it sure starts to feel pretty rare from a mathematical standpoint. Yeah. He, um, uh, Marcin Tabora. Tabora's a third round finish. Third round finish. Yeah. Shamil Abdurakhimov, fourth round finish. A split decision victory of Roy Nelson. Five rounds. Yeah. Five rounds? Oh, that was three rounds. Three rounds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there other, I know he's got a, lost to TKO by Mark Hunt for, in the fourth round. In the fourth round. Yeah. Listen, like, this isn't like, well, th now if we looked at that without seeing anything or knowing anything, our brains might go, this guy's in great shape. But your eyes say that's not true. And I'm not just talking about his body type. You see those, <sighs> this is desire, an inhuman level of desire. That's an, in, that's, and, I mean, Mark, everything I'm saying here is making sense to you, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, the, the, the truth doesn't, the, 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 the unadulterated facts are not lying to you. And it's actually completely contrary to what people perceived of Lewis after the Ngannou fight. Exactly. Because they thought that he was being gun shy, hasn't, write him off, they're yeah. both done, get yeah. him out of the UFC. Yeah. Now he's fighting for the now title. Now you see where he's at. It's like, so why do I, why did I take fucking eight? nine minutes to explain all that and and why did i repeat myself so many times because it's really i really want you to see it and i want you to attach yourself to it not hear a bunch of words and go that's true and then repeat them i want you to imagine 
like to the point the t- most exhausted you've ever been and then you've got hit in the head with a baseball bat a few times and you're still it doesn't really matter maybe you even you know it could be worth 200 grand to you or 60 grand if it's a double thing but it, it wouldn't matter to you because you wouldn't be capable of it i'm certainly not capable of it and i shouldn't speak for you but 99 out of 100 of us are not i need to imagine that it's not like your babies in in their you know, in a burning house. Most of you could do that. I believe in all of us that we can do that. This is sport. This is our bodies. You know, and sometimes he said he shit his pants and he's still doing shit like, that's real. That's real. And it is exceptional. And I'm saying it because I, not because I want you to put a little check mark by, you know, your imaginary list of Derek Lewis's attributes. I want you to look at it and go, Derek Lewis has a superhuman um, attribute, and that is desire, that is drive, that is commitment. Derek Lewis has a superhuman attribute there, and that's important. It's like that mentality where it's like, okay, the cage is locked. We're in here now. We got to make do. Yeah. Whereas some people can easily throw up an arm, you know, give up, tap out mentally yep. even. So Who I'm doesn't? gonna I'm gonna quickly. Uh, we're gonna talk in a separate section. Uh, you can find it on U- the YouTube. YouTube channel, or if you're listening to the long form, we'll get to it in a bit, about Connor and Habib. And people have asked, and people, they're, they're talking about every angle, which is something that we do when something is incredibly moving or compelling. Uh, but people ask about, uh, did Connor quit? Um, or, uh, I don't even want to acknowledge that anybody wants to criticize Anthony Pettis, you sicken me. <laughs> and I rarely say stuff like that to people. Um, but please go look at yourself. If you look at the, what that wonderful young man and his wonderful coach did, and, and you got any desire to, t- to criticize their drive and, and courage, you got to look at yourself. That's wrong. That's dead, dead wrong. There's not a lot of room there to, to discuss that. Uh, but, but Connor, did he quit? Um, and you can see the moment where he can no longer handle turning back into Habib. And surrender. This man looks at fighting as military engagement or warfare. And that is one of many ways to look at it. And he doesn't look exclusively and neither should you. And whatever your perspective is doesn't have to be your perspective forever. Um, but uh, and in military warfare... If, I, if we had 100,000 guys and they had 100,000 guys and they just stormed through something we couldn't protect and we lost 40,000, the reason we surrender is to protect the other 60,000. And if we know it cannot be won, if we know, the thing is you never know. So surrender is to protect your other 60,000 people or in the case of fighting, to protect your brain cells or your body or your future or the next fight. You know, uh, surrender so we may fight again for another day. Those are all real. Again, you know, it is your right as somebody who pays to consume these things and and you're passionate and stuff to criticize. And I I apologize if I, it's, it's only my passion that makes me so rude when I think about somebody criticizing Anthony or Duke. Uh, and I apologize. Um, I shouldn't be rude either. That's not, that's not cool. Um, it's not for what I stand for or believe in. Um, but um, it is your right to, to say that. But, I mean, to, to surrender is to protect what, what you have remaining because you believe you cannot win. Uh, there are exceptions to that. Belief is belief is belief. If I believe I cannot win, well, then I cannot win. Therefore, I should surrender. Here's the thing. Derek Lewis never believes that. Never. Right? Never. Never. Conor, Conor McGregor or anybody else in a similar, similar situation, and I don't know who gives up and who doesn't. I don't know. Even when you tap, sometimes if you're... And, and anybody who's competed in any type of submission type of um, game, sometimes you tap when you feel this, the, the, the ligaments going. Sometimes you tap just because you know you can't get out, and so we tap. And sometimes you don't tap in those, and you fucking take damage, and maybe you get out. Uh, but once you've decided you can't get out, it becomes true you should tap. Uh, and Derek Lewis doesn't make that choice. If he's made it before, please forgive me. If he's made it in the past, then I would say Derek Lewis almost never makes that choice. And he certainly didn't make it on that night. Again, now we're at many, many minutes of me saying this over and over again. Why? Because this matters. It's so rare. It's so rare. 
you know. Um, if you do um, subscribe to DAZN, there's some chat with me and uh, Chael Sonnen about this. It's so rare. The best of the best of the best of the best can only push themselves so far. Derek Lewis can go further. So why does that matter? Now we talk about Daniel Cormier as a separate entity before maybe we, we try to find how these two things meet. Well, Cormier, from a comparison standpoint, the standard ways we look at things, if you just side-by-sided things, who's better and by how much? Get, get Daniel Cormier to sprint, he'll sprint faster. Get him to, you know, uh, uh, do 100 wrestling takedowns, he'll get 100 of them done before Derek's done 17. And all of his will be smoother and nicer and more efficient and more powerful and more dangerous and harder to stop. Get Daniel Cormier to put together the smartest slipping and striking, not getting hit. He can do that in a way the naked eye can look and go, that's better than that. Every single category from which we make comparisons, uh, Daniel Cormier will win that category, with the exceptions of size. And then power, which we have discussed, is not a real thing. Power is created. Power is created through, through and um, the use of force, size, and mechanical efficiency expressed through technique in a way that, that harnesses energy to do damage. Uh, and I've used this example many times, but but um, uh, Francis Ngannou uh, was punching the uh, thing that measures force and it had the highest ever until Joe Rogan threw, <laughs> threw a turning sidekick. So does Joe Rogan, does Joe Rogan have more power than Francis Ngannou? Does he? According to this, he does. Um, the, so what we usually try to do when we are hit with a conundrum like this is we try to, rather than surrender our improper analysis or our improper connection to it, we try to find new layers to keep it. So it's like, you know, and we see this in politics and religion and all of the most debated things that, that are for often many of us uncomfortable, but we'll see it here too. We'll say, well, Joe Rogan kicked this substantially strong, harder than, than Francis Ngannou. Now, some people will be like, well, then I guess Joe Rogan has more power. Um, Cheers to you, Joe Rogan. Dude's got a lot of power. I've analyzed his game, his um, his martial arts. It's, he's a wonderful martial artist. Um, but does he have more power than than Francis? Now, if we don't surrender our improper connection to this concept and we just seek to explain it, we'll say, well, Mark, this this what we'll do, right? Like, bear with me right here. Francis Ngannou has more power with his punch. But Joe has more power with his kick. Oh, fuck. Now we've fucking doubled down on stupidity. We're wrong. There is no power. Power is not... Nobody has power. Power is created through this combination of skills and tactics and techniques and body and all these things. Um, so now we'll have to compare Francis's kick to Joe's kick. Then we'll go, well, Joe has more power in his turning sidekick than Francis. Then we'll be like, yeah, but Francis isn't as good at a turning sidekick. Well, what if he was better? He'd have more power. Boom, we found a flaw. Talent, technique, training. Francis doesn't have more power than Joe. Joe doesn't have more power than Francis. Joe's better at this thing. Overcomes the obvious powerful body. T now, well, we can keep explaining it or we can surrender that and go, okay, wait a second. What's actually happening? And what else are we missing? And why can Francis or um, Derek Lewis punch harder in round one than three? But then this punch was so powerful. Desire. Desire. Commitment. And commitment... When you take a big, powerful guy and you've taught him how to punch and you have him throw a punch so hard that it's the type of punch that he would fall down, why would he fall down? Because he just completely didn't edit himself in that punch. I don't know, edit, if that's the right word. Um, didn't limit himself. Didn't, um, you know, what's the word where you... It, didn't edit himself. Doesn't matter what the word is. Yeah, you're, you're following me. Well, that was different. Well, now he's got crazy power. But what about his jab? It's not like that. So, so that's the one area. He, he, can he at times hit harder than Daniel Cormier? He has at times. Dan's also hit harder than him at times. So we throw that one away. It's not, it's not real. It's, it's very, very shallow first. You know, it's not first principles thinking. It's all kinds of, all kinds of complex. So we throw that one away. And if we want to use our old way of comparison... 
Dan Cormier is better at everything. Um, and it, but Derek Lewis, when he's has that desperate commitment to to the fight, he can fight. Oh wait, before we say that, uh, Volkov was also better at everything. Everything. Volkov was better, moved better, smoother, s- stronger, sharper, technically more better, reach, uh, everything but weight. And even his weight was pretty high too. Mm-hmm. He and. If you, if you doubt me, then let's look at two minutes and 49 seconds and just judge that and say, on this night, this guy was better. Yeah, well, Derek Lewis fucking made that not true, right? They, we, the outcome of that fight was Derek Lewis knocked that guy out. And it was wonderful and beautiful. And I was so thrilled to see it. And it was so cool. And it just reminded you of one of the myriad of things that makes fighting so cool. But... Could he do that again? Of course he could, as long as he believes it. Now, minute 21 is harder, but Mark just told you that he knocked a guy out in the fourth round before. I think he was on top of him, but it's irrelevant. He was on top of this guy when he finally ultimately finished him. That's real. That's real. And there's a certain amount, when somebody hands you the, the, the chance to do something, most of us would do our best, but it's almost impossible. Now, I'm going to throw one, one thought out here. Maybe this will get repeated out of context, but that's okay. That's part of the game now. Uh, I find when you do, you know, Chael is a very good friend. When he says something crazy, I watch all his fucking things grow and more people watch him. It's a weird world we're living in. Um, but Daniel Cormier is better at every aspect of martial arts as an independent. Each in- Daniel Cormier is better at each independent area of martial arts than, than uh, Derek Lewis, at least as much as Floyd Mayweather was better at boxing than Conor McGregor. That's he fair. is. That's fair. It's, it's fair. And if you want to argue that point rather than, ex- than examine its meaning, knock yourself out. But if we start simply, and these are the building blocks, and the, I use this as another way to look at different, different aspects of it. Truthfully, these building blocks are not as important as they once were because of the way that the whole game is blended and expressed. But, but when we, Derek Lewis kind of wrestles a bit for five years or seven years or as long as he's been doing it, says he doesn't like it, kind of trains an hour a day. In the drop of a bucket compared to Daniel Cormier, a, a, who was a, a, an Olympic who, a, who, elite of the elite 10 years ago. Whose motto is embrace the grind. His motto is embrace <laughs> the grind. Tell me, please, honestly, is, is Daniel Cormier more or less better than Derek Lewis than Floyd Mayweather was over Conor McGregor? I mean, at least as much, probably more. The space between Derek Lewis and, and Daniel Cormier in the game of wrestling as, as by itself is larger than the space between Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather. We could say the same thing about just the art of kickboxing. I would also say that. About athleticism. As somebody who has been an Olympic caliber athlete and has been a driven athlete his entire life against Derek Lewis, who says he doesn't really like to work that hard. And uh, like... All of these areas are that big between them. And I still truly, truly think it's a beautiful fight. I do. I do. I really do. And I'm thrilled that I think that. It makes me happy to think that. It makes me happy to think that I think that. Because it's, it can be done. It absolutely can be done. Tr- truthfully, would you really be... Like, would it be like, oh my God, it was impossible. I never thought there was, I thought it was a 0% chance if Derek Lewis knocked out uh, Daniel Cormier somehow, knocked him down sort of and got on top of him, hit him a few times. Would you, would you be like, I just thought the possibility was zero? No, you, just, you didn't see it. If I may, asked you to make a pick or bet your money, you wouldn't have bet it. But you know it's possible. You know it. You saw it fucking, what, five, six, yeah. seven days ago? You know it. It's like the same thing in poker, you know, like uh, they used to show poker a lot here in Toronto on TV and whatnot, and, you know, the two guys would face off, and there's a 2% chance that guy would hit. Yeah. The, the 2% chance is still out there. Yeah. So don't be You like, need a two you know, of spades to come up. Don't be angry if guy hits. Exactly. There's still a 2% yeah. chance. And, it, and what, they call it a bad, so Mark's example, they call it a bad beat yeah. in poker. When the percentage chance that I get the only card in the whole deck that would actually give me the 
the thing comes up, it's a bad beat. And people will often say, well, you should never have made that bet. Mm -hmm. Fucking rights, I should. I want to look at all my stack of chips. Of course I should have made it. Yeah, but uh, st um, statistically speaking, well, yeah, you're right, statistically speaking. And statistically that's what's speaking, happening. speaking, I had a 2% chance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's one out of 50 times. Fucking roll roll a dice that goes from zero to or from 1 to 100. And you have a 2, a chance of a, of a 23 or a 24 coming up, you win and everything else. Well, fuck, sometimes it does. And... And the, what I love about this fight is it is possible. What I love about this fight is it'll also create a lot of tension in Cormier. Weird. He needs to overcome that. The weirdness of it and the, and the you know, man, if I lose to this guy, and not in a critical, critical way of, of Derek Lewis, just in a, uh, this is a fight I'm supposed to win every day of the week. Well, that come, that, that's, that's hard. It's a hard thing. It's a hard truth. You have, to, you have to admit it. It's floating around in there somewhere. You have to admit it, deal with it, and figure out how you're going to approach it knowing that's true. So it's a cool fight. Plus, how can you not kind of like Derek Lewis? He wasn't a big fan when he started talking shit about Travis Brown that time, saying they beat women when his, the, the accuser came back and said that was right. not true, and I apologize. There's a rare occasion. A lot of occasions, people who do a bad thing did that bad thing. There's rare occasions where they didn't. And when you propagate that, anyways, that's unrelated. That's, he's just a person doing his best. That's all any of us are doing. Um, and sometimes we get it wrong. Um, it's a feel good story for MMA. For like Derek? Derek Lewis. Yeah. Because like, for one, just his personality type, he's not a big fight fan. He doesn't know much yeah. about the UFC yeah. fighters. He's a big soccer fan. Yeah. And loves NASCAR. Yeah. Like. And he's a big, strong guy <laughs> with a lot of guts and, 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 uh, you know, I think the a comparison to him too is Roy Nelson. Yep. Not just because they're both kind of not shaped like athletes, but they're both kind of off the beaten track kind of guys, and uh, you you can connect to them. Men, now men I can't people. because of how big they are. I don't know what that's like. Uh, you know, it, it, those of us are, that are in the five foot six range don't know what that's like. But uh, but it's cool. You'll cheer for him, and, and Dan has to deal with that too. He has to he has to understand that too. That that and that matters. The the feeling shouldn't matter. Doesn't have to matter if you deal with it, but it can matter. Is the view from the audience of you and this guy, and what happens when he hits you one time, and they all cheer, and like you face that a lot in your life, but the meaning is different. All, he's got to he's got to prepare for all of that, and. Uh, and as a result, it's a really cool fight. Every single matchup in its own way gives you something. Every single one. And so often people are like, I hate this one. Why'd they make this? And then it's wonderful. And even if Dan beats this guy up and finishes him and after people go, well, obviously, you know, Dan's way better. Yeah. But on this night, on a night, that, that man could do it. Can you imagine Derek Lewis, UFC heavyweight champion? Derek Lewis, the Black Beast, the Black Beast, <laughs> UFC heavyweight champion. We'd be thrilled for him, and hopefully, um, he's talked about. Mark and I were talking about it before um, we rolled the camera. He said, talked about walking away from the game. It's hard. It sucks. There's a lot of things about back it you don't issues. Like. Yeah, yeah. And he's, he's back. He's been complaining yeah, about his got, back for a very long time. He's got body now. pain, and every time that dude won that fight, he should be proud of it. I'm sure he is. As we're recording this, it's five and six days later. He's still in a lot of pain. And for a lot of people that have never really taken a beating in a professional fight, um, you know, three and four days later, like walking, sitting, talking, you know, and it's easier when you win um, for sure, but it's still painful. So he's been through that a lot of times. And uh, even when you won and you won in the first round, sometimes you've blown something out from through exertion. You're exerting so hard. So, you know, if he were to win or lose, if I'm him, I'm like, I, I'm the UFC heavyweight champion. Peace. Mm -hmm. But that's in no way is my, me giving advice to, to, a, to an incredibly high level athlete about what he should do. I'm just saying what I would do, uh, but he should do what's good for him. But ultimately, Brilliant, brilliant, one of the greatest light heavyweights and heavyweights at, of all time, arguably the greatest, against a, a man with a dream who has an unstoppable will. That's cool. And uh, it's rare. And and he also has, four, you know, Dan will be 238 or something when he walks in there, but he's really, you know, the other guy will be 270, 280, 290 by fight time. He cuts a lot of weight. Could have 50 pounds on him. So heart, desire, 
that ferocious will to win, which, to be honest with you, Dan also has, as rare as that is. Yeah. Dan has it on whatever level, as re incredibly rare as it is. Um, but when you shut a man off, the, the way to overcome that will is to shut him off or to choke him out. So one of those guys will do it. Of course, it's most likely Dan, but, and Dan, but it should be yeah. this, the cool fight. And Dan has experience breaking people. Yeah. Like that that's a part of his skill set. Just grinding mm. out till you just break. So. Yeah. And yeah. It, and um when somebody is very unbreakable like this, the goal, you know, if you can break them, if you can make them say no mas, that's that's something pretty great. And and you're looking for your own your own um, challenges to overcome in fights. So uh we'll talk ag about this fight again, uh, I believe. Um before we've got a few weeks but uh, i hope people enjoy it i hope they enjoy it for what it is and um i won't cheer against you dan cormier because uh i am a, a eternal fan of yours but i certainly uh won't cheer against you either Derek lewis i hope you have the night of your life all right um we are moving on and we uh if you are watching on youtube this is the um the uh, what do you call these things the program. Uh, the program. The program. And on, on one side is Habib, and on the other side is Conor McGregor. If you're listening on podcast, well, I'm holding up the program. What it does say on both sides is, the world is watching. Yeah, that was true. Yep. That was true. That was absolutely true. A couple million people bought it, and then bars and restaurants and those, their friends. They're for sure... And then Russia, it's free, and Europe, it's free, and Brazil, Regular it's free. Regular people were watching this. Oh, okay. everybody was watching one. this. A lot of things to talk about. I think the very first one we'll want to talk about is the fight itself. Um, now, um, the second, and, and then some of the other things. I personally, there's always it, things outside of there. The matchups, the next matchup, you know, what does it mean for the division? Those things um, I got bored of many years ago, and it doesn't mean I'm certainly not judging you if that's your, your jam, and, uh, and please don't think that I am. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm just looking for, you know, new and interesting aspects, things that the way it might force me to think and force me to look at difficult questions about myself or you know, challenge or growth, um, even culture and the world. So we'll want to talk about some of that. There's a lot of really wild things. Um, to study anything deeply is to connect it to all things and all things to it. And uh, that is, in the last couple of years of deep study, it's been one of the great gifts to me personally. And when I share it and talk about it and dig into it, there's a percentage of people who really find it enjoyable too. And if you're not one of those, then I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, But uh, it's one thing that, that we definitely look at maybe on this channel, somewhat unique to, to our perspective. But uh, so the fight itself, let's start there. Um, going in, I... Uh, I didn't want to just, there was something frustrating for me about the obvious of it. And it was something frustrating for me that I didn't, I couldn't find different layers to talk about it. And, uh, and I felt that, uh, and I found plateaus there and how to look at, at fights and martial arts and stuff. And those are good. Those are good things. The, uh, we should all be so lucky to find frustrations in our in how we think and realize I'm I can't do this I'm weak here why can't I do this better or why why where else can we go this can't be all there is uh, it's it's stressful but it forces you to think of different ways but among so and one of the things I did was try to kind of examine the narrative not something I usually do but I thought well I don't you know it seems obvious the conversations that are out there so let's see what they are and why we're looking at them and one of the biggest you know, uh, McGregor on the feet will will beat this guy up, and Khabib on the mat will maul him. Um, and then a, a step further than that, people would be like, "It's going to be cut and dried. I can't see this being a back back and forth fight." And I remember thinking, and we talked about it a fair bit, but I disagreed pretty fully with that um, a few times. But then you think a lot, around a lot of different things. I I saw Dan Hardy as a friend of mine, a good friend, and we did something together. If you go to tsn.ca slash UFC, you'll see a 20, 30-minute chat Dan and I had. 
um, and we've done other work together, and we're going to do some other work in the future. We talked about a podcast. We got to spend a little time together chatting. I saw people coming down on Dan. Ah, oh, see, you said Connor would, would smoke this guy. And I don't know why you would come down on Dan because he said that, but he also said to me, well, yesterday I thought this, but today I think this. Today I think, you know, 55-45 because, you know, I watched this, I watched Connor do this and I started to imagine that. But now that I've looked at these aspects of Habib, I'm feeling this way. And people pinpoint a moment in time and say, that's what you believe, Dan Hardy, or that's what you believe, Steve, my buddy, or that's what you believe, Mark Manoharan, or that's what you believe... People, we're all fucking fluid and plastic it, it, and ever really changing. It's really funny because analysts, the most, change their mind every because they all like their their brain doesn't shut off. Yeah. So you always look at something and see something new and say, "Oh, of course, this is the new thing." Which is so. why I I talk to people not about I wouldn't advise you guys, my friends, and I wouldn't advise my other people who do jobs similar or, or somehow connected to what I do don't make picks because I don't want them to get in trouble on Twitter. They don't care and they shouldn't care. And in fact, most of them understand that it actually grows them a lot um, and uh, gets them, you know, these days controversy grows your ability to do your job. I say it because I don't want you to get trapped somewhere. I don't want you to get trapped somewhere and then, you know, only see things that support your view. But th so I'm sorry I get off topic, but these things mean a lot to me. They do. I think this conversation, and I know I have it over and over again, but I believe this can alter the way that we argue about politics or Donald Trump or, or Russia or, you know, anything, anything. This can change the way we see the world if we just stop choosing a side and shutting our brains out to everything. But anyways, that, those aspects brought me to starting to look at, well, why couldn't this be back and forth? Why couldn't they, you know, and not only that, if you really believe that it's only this by ground and pound until it's over or this by left hand until it's over, and trust me, that's part of my job. And I even did it with Kevin Lee. Part of my job is to have that conversation. But when we can sit and talk deeper than just part of the job, we can look at the truth. If this guy, I'm, and right now, podcast listeners, I'm holding up Habib's face. If this guy thought, and he, the, all the expert people around him thought they were going to fight the other guy uh, six or nine months later, they wouldn't just go, well, we better get him down or we're fucking dead. Of course they wouldn't do that. They'll start working on the game. They'll start working on what matters. And the greats will break down the pieces of it. You don't have to become a better jujitsu guy than a guy who's done 30 years of jujitsu when you've done seven you just have to find the, the 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 bottlenecks of things that matter you don't have to be a quote better boxer than conor mcgregor if you fight him you just have to figure out how to do the thing if you can land your overhand right or if you can if you can make him exotic like you find answers you find fucking answers. And if you're, I'm holding up the other guy, Conor McGregor, if you're that guy and you're facing the best, somebody who's so dominant beats everybody up on top, you change your approach. All of a sudden, you're pointed towards him. In round one, you saw that. If you can take almost no damage by playing it differently than everyone else played it, that's a real thing. And of course those things happened. You know, of course they did. And any smart fighter anywhere in the world, and most of them are smart, and every great coach has already been thinking like this, now suddenly realizes the answer isn't to out-wrestle the wrestler. The answer is to solve a key problem or two. The answer isn't to outstrike the striker. The answer is to solve a key problem or two. And it was something I intended to do going in. Mark Coleman versus um, uh, Maurice Smith. And we talked about it. I intended to do it, but I've had issues with using UFC footage. They don't let anyone use it, although you'd be fucking surprised to hear that when you just open Instagram. There's thousands of them everywhere. I don't know if they're all getting shut down or not, but uh, that's, that's how they were handling it before. And if they're not all getting shut down, then I, I want to know that pretty soon because then I'm going to start using the footage again. Like, you know, you have to know where you're at. Is this, what's the policy? But... I took that footage and I went into um, at New Era Combat Sports. It's in Canada, which is outside of Ottawa. I did a seminar with Crew Jeff, who's a fantastic 
martial artist and obsessed martial artist with finding different ways to grow. And he brought me in. He said, hey, you want to do a breakdown seminar with my guys? And uh, great, great martial artists, a uh, great line of thinking. I was honored, but and he, even before I said it, he said, um, I know what you're thinking. You're not a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and you're not a kickboxing world champion. I don't care. You have a perspective and you have something that's of valuable value and I want you to share it with my people. And I was thrilled. So we did a lot of di- looking at a lot of different things over that two and a half, three hour seminar. But among them, we looked at Maurice Smith versus uh, Mark Coleman. And Maurice Smith won that fight in 20 minutes. And about 16 minutes of it were on the ground. And he didn't out-wrestle the wrestler on the ground. He used framing techniques from Muay Thai while underneath a guy who was wrestling. He didn't out-wrestle the wrestler. He used things the wrestler didn't use. He beat the wrestler with Muay Thai off his back, inside fighting. And when I was showing it and I said, what is this? And there was a collar tie and a thing. And uh, Jeff, crew Jeff goes, that's fucking Muay Thai. And it was. It was Muay Thai from the bottom. There's always ways. There's always ways. There's going to be more. Trust me. You're going to see more. It's going to be very exciting. It's going to be very exciting. Taking different aspects, different... Because uh, what's a frame? I put this here and I, and I use my... It's just a concept. It's a concept based on a strong body position and, and a, a, a correct concept from the right angle, well trained by me to do a certain thing. And my step after Jeff said, that's Muay Thai, was I agreed. And then later I said, no, it isn't because there's no such thing as Muay Thai. (laughs) To which when I say that, most people are like, now you're crazy. But there's no such thing as these things. They're just concepts. Because by this point, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which once didn't exist, like when did somebody call it Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? It was taking... In judo, there are grappling techniques that were used for this purpose. They were kind of forgotten or rarely used as the sport progressed a particular way until this powerful, smart family and key people put them back in. And because they were from Brazil, they called it Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And that ain't that long ago. And before that, it didn't exist. Only it did because it's just concepts. It's just fighting concepts. And that is all Khabib Nurmagomedov and Conor McGregor did with their coaches who will not... No matter when, especially when there's a winner and a loser, but even outside of that, will not get the credit that they deserved. We're talking about how great Khabib's grappling was, and yes, he landed a big right hand and didn't get hurt by Connor, but we're not going to credit Javier Mendez as much as we should. And when Connor didn't get beat up in round one by using smart positional approach and not doing the things that got you beat up, because it wasn't just getting out wrestled when, when Khabib beat guys up, he had smart dominant positions that he had trained a lifetime and reactions. And you got to stay away from those. You can't, what do you do if he gets you in the rest, wrist ride? You take a shit beating. That's what you do. What's the answer? Don't get, don't let him get your wrist. How do we do that? Don't get on all fours. Don't get on all fours. Don't go to four points to get away. How do we do that? Well, it'd be good if we didn't get taken down, but if we don't, we better turn back into him. Cause if we give him our back, that guy's going to murder us. Pretty good job. They did a pretty good job in round one. And then we credit Habib. Round two. Credit Habib. And here's here's probably where my favorite credit to Habib goes from that fight. That uh, I'm sure other, there's lots of people smarter than I, and I'm sure some of these mentioned it. Um, But uh, this is key. People talked about how, well, Connor did well in round one, and he did, did very well. And that's good. Again, that's not, it's not you crediting the enemy. It's give the enemy their due so that you can show your ability. If, if Habib just beat the crap out of this guy for seven minutes, it would not be as fulfilling a fight. It would not say as much about the greatness of Habib Nurmagomedov. Uh, he did pretty well in round one. And then people, when we look at it, well, one of the aspects, we'll zero in on only one, that is, well, Habib breaks you down and he makes you tired and then you're in trouble. That is true. But as important or more important is he also learns in the moments. He learns in those positions. So Habib is attacking me. And trust, uh, Habib had me in a single leg in uh, Calgary and gentle, nice, <laughs> smiling. He was very cool. And I was fucking terrified. Not just because he was Habib. It's just you can feel like the... You know, and he was messing around. He let me get the, you know, the hook back in and kind of like defend, and then kind of went to a double and I gently put my hands across his face because I didn't want him to hurt me. Um, 
but I could feel like the the reality of what it was and he wasn't literally playing with his kid making sure he didn't hurt the fucking analyst from Canada because he'd get in probably some trouble although they'd probably sweep that under the rug and just say I fell piece me off with a few dollars and the UFC be like look Robin here like he didn't really hurt he didn't mean to you know that uh, not saying that's ever happened because if it did I certainly don't know about it but and I'm being somewhat joking. But anyways, I could feel how fucking real all that shit was. So let's just imagine for a moment that I actually had, and Connor is just an extension of just any other person because he's just a person. Habib has a single, and I loop in for, the, um, for, the, um, for a whizzer, and then I put my hand on the inside, and I take my shin, and I put it across his shin. This is step one. And then I either push down on the head or pull up on the head or I break the grip with my leg or my hand or whatever my answer is. And then we, the audience, would be like, holy shit. Holy shit, Robin defended. That means he's going to be up. Which, trust me again, that would never happen. I couldn't defend shit against Habib. So please don't take that out of context. And if somebody does, fucking call them on it if they don't add this part because it's real. And people do shit like that all the time. Um, not to me, because I'm small potatoes, but to big potatoes they do. So somehow I defend it. People are like, holy fuck, Connor defended a takedown. If I, if I worked on that one way to defend a beam's takedown, you know what he's going to do next time? Make me defend that way and then do the next reaction to that. Or the next one. All he's, he's got 30 or 80 or 12 A and B. He's got 37. He's got 50 different ways from me doing the right thing. The right thing is take the arm, wizard it inside, shin across, push out on the head or pull or lift, and that's it. That's the right thing. I, got, I went to wrestling class in 2008 when I first started fighting, and they taught me to do that. And now I know. Therefore, I can stop Daniel Cormier. No, because... There's a there's layer on layer on layer on layer. Each position is just a position. Whatever position we're in is just a position. And once we get to one that is correct for me and I know the A, B, and C of what to do from there, they know fucking Greek, Spanish, uh, Chinese, and all these other languages that I don't understand. So when Connor prepared himself to have an answer for Habib in round one, he did it. And it worked, and he deserves a little bit of credit. That's real. He was, that was incredibly well prepared. He was also calm, excellent. But now Habib just speaks a different language in round two. Okay. And Habib's not going to, And the, well, they might eat a little bit. It's certainly one day, give each other credit. But Habib, to his friends with no cameras around, will be like, actually, I was surprised. You know, he had, he had some, some answers there for me in round one. He moved the head back to the inside. He put the butterfly hooks in. He stayed calm. I was impressed. So what'd you do? I just fucking went one of my other 37 routes until I found where he was weak. That's it. That's all it is. You know, you cannot prepare to defend the best um, Brian T. City. Okay, we haven't seen him doing triangles for the last while, but it's because he's got other things as well. But if you find yourself close to a triangle for Brian T. City, you'll get triangled because he has, you know, if you each reaction offers him something else. And that's Habib in round two. That's Habib in round two. Notice eventually he's standing over him, and he didn't do as much damage as he would have liked, but he realized, oh, standing over him, he's going to work his feet on my hips. He's going to look for a moment where he can set up a De La Hiva type submission, one foot behind the knee, one foot in the hip, the other hand on the, on the ground. Imagine you have a foot here, and you have your hand holding this, and you have a foot pulling here. This pulls, this pushes, and this pulls, and you go down. That's what he's looking for. And Habib's like, fuck, I ha I'm better at not getting swept in that way than he is at sweeping in that way. Also, this just hit me. That's a variation, a setup that Connor kind of worked against Diaz. Which, when you think about it, credit Habib that, and his people, because they were like, okay, actually, that's pretty fucking impressive to be able to sweep Nate Diaz there. Yes, Nate wasn't expecting it. I will be expecting it. I saw him do it before. I know that's one of his spots. Okay, great. So now, offer to him. He's looking for it. Meantime, I punch him a bunch of times. Okay, round two's done now. And now I'm up two rounds. Did anyone give him a 10-8 round? 
Yeah, I, don't, I think he got a 10-8 yeah, round. Yeah, I think he got a 10-8 round. Maybe, maybe deserved, although when another guy jumps up and smiles and he's not bleeding, but that's not really it's supposed to be about I did a shitload to you and you did nothing to me, and that's real. So I could have given him a 10-8 round personally, and I'm pretty unbiased. Um, although it's hard to do. I mean, somebody's we're all we're all humans. Humans are biased. Don't judge people for being biased. We're all biased. What we're looking for is people to be as, le- as little biased as possible, but zero bias... You know, maybe there's someone stoic enough out there, maybe, but not many, not one in, not even one in a hundred, certainly not. Um, but yeah, so now we're up. And then now into round three, what else did we benefit? We're Habib. We've also, we've heard him. Fuck. I don't care how he looks. We've heard him. Did the overhand r- right land in the third round? Round two. Or, or round round two. two. Yeah, that helped too. That certainly. Because yeah, Connor and, came, yeah. not came yeah. back, but Connor uh, won the third round. But mm-hmm. many say, like, Habib while we're giving credit, Connor won the third round. Now, that could have been strategic or could have not been strategic. So, round two, Habib lands the overhand right. Does that make Habib a better striker than Connor McGregor? Sure, if you're an idiot arguing with somebody on Twitter. But in reality, the, it, all you're doing is showing the weakness of these comparisons. You're illustrating the weakness of these compar- Who's a better striker, this guy or this guy? Well, this guy dropped them with one punch, therefore him. Come on, let's not be ridiculous. What we're proving is that those comparisons are weak and that if we really truly care enough to go beyond these areas, we must give ourselves the challenge of not using these flawed comparisons. Very hard to do. Ask somebody to talk about fighting and say, don't, don't use the word striker versus grappler, ground and pound, power. It's very fucking difficult to do, but it can be done. As soon as you give yourself like, hey, wait a second, I'm going to try to avoid flawed things. And when I say them, I'll be like, oh, shit, I did yeah, it. If you just use the process yeah. of deduction, yeah. we'll come to a conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyways, that, the only reason I mention that is because I'm hoping over time that we, that we can, can – uh, find our way through these plateaus that we've been stuck at for a little while. But yeah, Habib drops him, beats him up. That And that oh, that single right hand that dropped him in addition to the beating, yeah, right. We've just, uh, I would have given, if I was judging, not for the point of view of talking about it on television after or just freaking out because I'm having so much fun. Uh, I was strictly assigned the job of, of um, scoring. I think I might have given that a 10-8 as well. But then Connor comes back and wins round three. Keeps it on the feet for a great deal of it. Moves his feet. Um, lands some punches. Habib lands some too. And then this is the one where people zero in and say, oh, did Connor look like himself? You know, uh, he wasn't, uh, he was flat-footed out there. He wasn't playing with the range. It's all these things. It's like, I can agree with you, but not if you are making that point to somehow say, use this as an excuse for the loss. All of that happened because of what Khabib did to him. All of that happened, not just damage or fatigue, not just strikes to the head and the body and, and, and fatigue to the muscles and, and the body tissues because of being underneath and fighting to, 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 to work so hard with a guy on top of you, but also pressure. Uh, there was something somewhere I saw. It might have been Ariel. It was a clip of Connor talking, and he talked about how he, he credited Habib that he had underestimated him, and that's not an insult ever, by the way. Underestimating somebody is saying, I treated them with respect, which not not the things he said he didn't, but with the, the approach, I want to... I Nobody ever approaches a fight trying to not do well. You approach it trying to do well, and to do that, you've got to look and go, he's good here, he's good here, this is real, or you're fucked. So, and I know they're, they're team to a degree, and I know that's what they did. And then what you say is... We went in and said, these are real things to deal with. And it turned out he was even better than we thought. So it's a weird type of compliment within the truth. Um, But then he also said, Habib was on autopilot. And I don't remember if he said panicked or thinking too much or both. I can't remember exactly. But Habib was on autopilot is really important. Because Habib wasn't out there thinking. And other than Nate Diaz... Everybody else was out there thinking. Everybody. They're thinking, what do I do? What's he saying? Why did he say that? You know, uh, you know ask Mendez. Ask. Uh, he's like, wow, yeah, give it to him. And like, man, he was talking. Uh, or Poirier. He's like, yeah, I guess he got into my head. Or Aldo. Aldo hasn't talked about it a great deal, and I don't blame him. Uh, Aldo, Mark and I were talking about that's probably the fight we'd like to see the most. Because Aldo now would be entirely different. Oh, yeah. It, still... 
still there are advantages in different ways and stuff and Connor's still larger at whatever weight they're at but uh but that's the fight all those the 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 specialness of Jose Aldo we some people forgot and it's you know it's real um but uh but everybody else Connor broke their autopilot autopilot's important that's flow we're out there flowing we spent our lifetime doing this. I know what I want. You start to do it. You're not thinking. You're not thinking, oh, my God, I better get a takedown or else this guy's going to punch me. You're punching. You're moving. You're grabbing. It's not there. You're flowing. It's flow. It's a state. It's a, it's a, it's a physiological brain state. And Habib was in it. And, and when Connor cannot put you in it, not take you out of it, so far it's taken him out of it. And what's even more impressive was even leading up to the fight in the most recent interviews leading up yep. to it, Habib was saying how, yeah, Connor is in my head. I'm, yeah. You know, he's yeah. got me riled up. I'm angry. And yeah. even with all that, yeah. he still maintained that tunnel vision but, task at hand. But it's better to, to admit it than deny it. Yeah. Because if you admit it, you are, you plan for it. You prepare for it. You know it's real. Eddie denied it. And I, I it pains me because then it's not overly critical. We're just looking at moments. Eddie's going to still have his best moments ahead of him. And he's got br- many brilliant ones. But he tried to deny that Connor could do that, and that's not the right answer. He'll never do it again. What did he, what did he say? Didn't he Santa say Claus it? isn't real. Santa Claus. Santa's isn't, not the, real. The man doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's not a real thing. Oh, it is a real thing. You have to be ready that it's a real thing. And Habib was ready that it was a real thing. And actually, I said when when Connor can't get you out of it, it gets him out of it. But that's not true. Those first couple of rounds of Nate Diaz one, Connor looked actually fucking yep. amazing uh, in in both Nate Diaz fights. But in Nate Diaz one, Connor was fucking in flow state, and Nate still beat him. Um, but in this one, he was not. Uh, but that isn't an excuse, and it better nobody better look at it that way. It's a credit to Habib Nurmagomedov. He 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 was better, and. Uh, Something we always try to talk about and, and uh, isn't always easy to illustrate, but this fight it is. It really doesn't fucking matter that your punch shot off Jose or that you took Michael Johnson's shot or that uh, you, once you get the wrist ride, nobody else can do anything or you wrestled fucking bears or you fought 10 rounds again. None of that fucking matters. What matters is on this night, who is the better man in this moment? Talk to, I've referenced Chael if you're listening or watching the whole length podcast instead of just chunks today. Something that we talked about with Chael, uh, you know, back in Portland. It only matters now. And that's not an excuse. It should never be an excuse. You signed a contract that at 9 p.m., probably 10, closer to 10 p.m. on, what was the date of that fight? October 8th? I think it was like, yeah, let's say it was October 8th. Apologies if it was the 7th or the 9th. At 10, 9.55 p.m. between these moments, you will be ready to go in that cage and fight. And if you are not and you lose and you make an excuse of any kind, that's all bullshit. And if you're the fan of one side and you make any excuse of any kind, you're bullshitting. They don't matter. You signed a thing, you made a choice, you were doing it, all that mattered, oh, you might do better in the future? If it was done again and you didn't have diarrhea or you didn't injure your foot in the back or this didn't happen, well, great, go earn your right to do it again and let's see in those moments that you sign. All of these excuses are 100% irrelevant, especially, oh, did his gas tank look on? He made him. You made you. That was that was by design because yeah. Luke Thomas pointed something out that was uh, really interesting. He said, "When Connor gets gassed, his drop off is so severe yeah. and so noticeable compared to say a Frankie Edgar. When Frank gets gassed, it looks like he's twenty five percent slower. Yeah. When Connor gets gassed, yeah. it's like he's fifty percent slower." Yeah, but that is psychological. Which, psychological. That is a hundred. That is, I can say a hundred percent psychological. It is. It is your interpretation of how scary it is to fatigue and could be brought that on to on yes to him. yes yeah. he did and he he earns he deserves that yeah. but if you like are not in shape oh well if i was in better shape then i would have won fuck you <laughs> you know why you weren't in better shape because you didn't work hard enough mm-hmm. oh you're in better shape because you took it on short notice you took it on short notice all of it is your fault yeah all of it and it, 
and if you if you follow us, we're always looking for something. What what do we learn out of this that's useful in our life? It's all your fucking fault. It's all your fault. Uh, one of the things that comes up in conversation, if I'm going to use a personal story, people are like, hey, why aren't you working at the UFC? I'm not exactly sure, but it is 100% my fault. Whatever it is, whatever I did or didn't do, is shit I did or didn't do. Who the fuck, how do you blame? Oh, man, see, and, and again, to be a fan of someone, you get the choice of doing what you want to do. You don't have to listen to me or anybody else's perspective. I'm only passing on what I believe would be the most beneficial if we choose to go down that road. But Connor looked out of shape. Well, then fuck him. And he would say that. He'd be like, fuck me, this is my fault. I believe. I've seen it in the past he has. Or, you know, um, who was that guy Habib fought on short notice? Um, uh, was it Daniel Horcher? Yeah, Daniel Horcher. Well, Daniel Horcher. Or, or Chad Mendes. Because like, Horch, Horcher's choice to take that can be motivated by many things, including I will, my chances of winning are very low. However, if I do what I've got to do here, this will give me ch more chances in the future. And that is that is a choice made intentionally by a person with all the information. So that, no, we can't judge him for that. Uh, and... He certainly, I hope, I certainly didn't hear him ever making any excuses. Uh, or or um, uh, when, uh, when uh, Ferguson, who of course had a brilliant night, fought... Uh, Lando Venata. Lando Venata. Jesus. Venata didn't say, well, if I had six weeks, I'd have been... You took it! You took it! Somebody didn't make you take it. It's not like, well, you thought there would be more weeks, but this was offered, you took it. There's no fucking excuse. Mm -hmm. There's never an excuse. Never. Never. Uh, there's explanations of some type, but yet it's on you. If, you. if you did have diarrhea and you couldn't fight, well, you fucking chose what to eat. Or if it was your dietician, you hired him. Like it's your, all of it has to be on you because the benefit of that is if it is, you can improve it. Yeah, I can't remember who it was. Ch Chad Mendez some, yeah. on short notice. You yeah. know, Ch Chad took it. There you was don't some... then say, well, if I had a longer notice. You didn't. You took it. You yeah. lost. There was some fight. I can't remember the name, but it was a big fight. Oh, Diego Sanchez, the night before, he ate steak tartare, which is raw steak with yeah. egg. Like, yeah. you don't eat yeah. that before a fight. Yeah. Diego's you know, different. Be responsible. Uh, yeah. Did he win or lose? I think he lost. Yeah. Uh, I think he blamed on the, yeah. host, and the he, steak tartare. And he may have ex used that explanation or used it as an excuse. And, but, and that would be wrong of him. And if we looked at this conversation deeply enough, knowing what I know, and I've spent time with Diego, I really like him, I think he'd probably agree. Um, but yeah, in this case, like, please do not go and, and hey, do what you want. But, but I, I think we'd get a lot more benefit out of going in if Connor looked flat in round three, instead of going, he looked flat, you know, see, he wasn't himself, right? If he was himself, maybe he'd be, none of that makes any sense. If you thought he didn't look flat, hey, why didn't Connor, or, or why he did look flat? Why did Connor look flat in round three? If you look at educated explanations or you, and you don't have the education to do it, go to somebody who does. Could have been the beating Habib laid on him, affected him physically. Could have been the beating that Habib laid on him in the second round, affected him psychologically. Could have been his own preparation, which is his own goddamn fault. Any of these things is either a credit to the guy or failure on your part. All of it. All of it. Always. And even if there's some weird occasion that it's not, and of course disasters happen to people, it's still better to, to look for your fault in it. Uh, and if you do, you can actually come back and win next time. It's possible. It is possible. We, um, so anyways, round three does pretty well, wins the round. But by round four, Habib now, strong, smart, fearless, because he took the guy's best that he had, uh, after the beating he gave him in round three, then he came out and started um, controlling and doing his thing. And if you did uh, watch the long form of the podcast, there's people talk about surrender. Um, now, a lot of us, all of us, have not done what these men have done. Um, so when we criticize a, you know, somebody who rose to the you know, prime minister of something or the boss of something. We don't have their experience. We haven't done any of the things they did. We quit along the way. Somebody said, hey, do you want to run for office? We're like, no, I quit. You quit before it even started. If somebody said hey, when you were 10, hey, do you want to play hockey? And you were like, no, well, you quit. It doesn't mean you wanted to 
And sometimes it'd be like, yeah, but you know, I don't have any money. Well, neither did that kid, but somehow he did it. Like you quit. We quit. Our road to the UFC champion, all of us, our road to being UFC champion, we all quit. Every single one of us. Every one of us. Some of us quit on the first question. Hey, you want to train martial arts? No, that's not my thing. Okay, you quit. It's okay. We're all quitters. Everybody's a quitter. Everyone's a quitter at everything. We quit all the time. We, we quit on our fucking diet. And we like every day we quit a lot. All of us. Now, we can learn from it. It can be of value to us. But when you give up and th- th- we, quitters, all of us, every one of us, every day, um, we judge people who have said, I won't quit, 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 thousands and millions of times up to the NFL game and then they just can't do it or up to the, the, you know, the UFC title and can't do it, up to facing it, accepting it, walking into the cage, fighting the first 30 minutes. You know, we, we judge those fucking people. How dare we? Like, even, how dare we? Some people will win the belt and at that point, it's, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. We, we yeah. judge George St. Pierre. After that fucking fight, we judged him. We shouldn't do that. We can if you want. Do what you like. But if you think about it, it's insane. And when you surrender, you can surrender because when you surrender, you believe this fight, battle, diet, relationship, you know, political thing, whatever you do, whatever it is, you believe it's now unwinnable. Once you believe that, it is unwinnable. And... None of us, none of us. So I, I was in a fight and I couldn't see and at all. I couldn't see at all in that, those moments. Um, and I remember crying after I was not able to see and I hid my face. And, and, uh, and I remember telling myself, or actually before even, because there was a doctor there and, and I can't see. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, well, other guys have fought with two broken hands. Like that actually went through my head. And I was like, well, I can't do this. And I was really, really down and sad. And still makes me sad to think about it. But I just couldn't. I just couldn't. Would have loved to. Wanted to. Thought about it. Considered it. Thought, well, other people have done it. Um, you know. And just, you can't. To quit is not like you've now just, I'm sitting around and let, Mark, when you worked in the bank, Mark worked in a bank. And he fucking hated it. And it was making him insane. You thought about it. For days and weeks leading up to it. Like you hated it. You weren't sure about it. You yeah. thought you might quit. Yeah, for sure. Well, in the moments of a fight, you don't have any of that. Your brain is telling you, stop getting me smashed in the head. Stop. Protect me. I am you. I'm a big part of you. The brain inside. It's demanding it. It's demanding it. You can't, like, and you, all of us, every one of us, fucking put out our favorite chocolate or or or, uh, or uh, chip and say don't eat it our brain eventually demands us to eat it we're not weak we are what we are somebody else would judge us as weak but then somebody else will eat 75 bags of it and then somebody else might not eat it for an hour we're all just fucking we're, we have what we have we have what we have there you know we can train it and we can improve it and when you identify it and admit it you improve it and I'm much more mentally strong than I was six months ago and much more mentally strong than before that. And some of that is these failures. But to surrender is when you believe you cannot win. Um, and we do that every day, every single one of us. And then we judge these people at the highest level who don't surrender for months and years of their life and then finally do under the most adverse conditions. And especially when fighting is, like, you know, you, you say in, in the one-man show, it's everything your body and nature tell, is taught you not to do. Yeah, it's like, if I punch you in the face right now, you're, unless you've, you've trained or been in a lot of physical conflicts or played a sport that takes head trauma, you will cover your face and turn your back. That's what we. That's what our genes do. Like it, we do we're that. Born that way. <laughs> yeah, we were born that way. We do that because once upon a time, if our ancestors got a couple of teeth knocked out, they'd get an infection and they'd die. If they got their fucking nose smashed and they couldn't breathe properly, they'd die. If damage was done to their eye and they couldn't see, they would die. They were wandering the fucking Serengeti or whatever area of the world it was at the time, trying to survive. This was the right thing to do. You train that out for. 
decades of your life. And then that happens. And then Anthony Pettis wants to, uh, you know, his coach says, don't fight with a broken hand. I don't want you to have an injury that lasts a lifetime. And we judge them. We can't do that. Sorry. We can do that. But if you give it a lot of thought, maybe you won't. And if maybe you don't, it'll make you think about yourself. And maybe if you think about yourself, you'll gain some kind of valuable thing that'll help you grow. We've been talking for a long time, and I wanted to talk about the, um, some of the, the cultural implications of things. And they're real, uh, but we'll talk about that next week. Um, I also wanted to talk about John Jones versus, um, versus Alexander Gustafson. So we'll do that. And then uh, next week, we'll be back with another Enjoy the Hostilities. Uh, Fight preview. A very quick five-minute fight preview. John Jones. er Early analysis. Early analysis. Very quick, early analysis. John Jones versus Alexander Gustafson. We will do two, maybe three more deeper analysis of of, uh, this fight including different perspectives, including about, you know, their first fight, their body types, and all these things. But early analysis, five-minute uh, analysis. John Jones returns from a long break that, although you can look at a little bit of footage of him training, and there is some, um, because these days we can peek into people's worlds. It's something they need to do for their own businesses uh, to stay seen. Uh, so you can see a little bit about what he's doing. They're sparring with Holly Holm, play sparring, like tech sparring. But for the most part, we don't know what he's been doing. It's a really, really powerful thing. Now, Alexander Gustafson, quite wisely, also has taken a, a substantial amount off of time off because he looked at the world and said, I will gain more by waiting and trying to fight Cormier. Oh, wait, Jones is coming back. Okay, we'll fight that guy. Smart. Doesn't always work out that way. Happy for him that it did. The early analysis for me to look at, one is the last fight, but two is that fight, why was it so close? Among the reasons is it shows us what the top-level guy, what a top-level matchup is like when the physical advantages of John Jones is uh, met, countered, or, or equalized. And it, this is tricky to discuss because I don't want anybody out there, I, I hate it when I hear people who may not like John Jones, and if you don't like somebody, you look for, for negative things instead of the beauty in what they do. People like to say, well, John Jones just, you know, is really long or, you know, he's very lean. Or they look at his reach. That is one tiny aspect. Or sorry, it's one legitimate aspect. Of, no, it's not tiny. One legitimate aspect of that fighter. But there's lots Lots of other things, many, many other things in there. You know, the way he's free to do things. Now, some of that comes from finding safety at range, but but it's the freedom. He switches, he changes stances, he moves in different arcs and angles, he takes damage better than we give him credit for. Uh, he moves, He's he's got a mean streak. There's something, something dark in there somewhere, not always, and... You know, I hope that he's happy in the world right now and he's a family man and there's, there's, there's all kinds of beautiful things about his life, I'm sure. So don't, just don't mis- misinterpret this. But in combat, there's a dark streak in there. It's powerful. It's a very powerful thing. You know, there's an element, there's a, a sadistic element that he wants to hurt you. That has to be there at the, at the highest level unless you can be, you know, so artistically skilled that you don't need it. But even as I say that, John, Jones is both of those things, right? So take an artist as, as elegant as John Jones and then add that. You know, that's powerful. Um, great coaching. A, a coach, Greg Jackson, I think, has been his major coach, although I know Wink and some of the other ones have all been involved. Brandon and many of the all their wrestling coaches. And and um, uh, who's our, our guy that we hung out with uh uh, wrestling coach um, down, uh, I forget. Wrestling coach. We were, uh, I forget where we were, and we were with uh, with him. Oh, we went to a casino. I- Izzy. Oh, yeah, Izzy, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Izzy Martinez, one of the great wrestling coaches. All of these great people got Jones as raw clay. Incidentally, uh, Platinum Mike Perry, also they got pretty raw. And he has a lot of these brilliant 
things that John has. Maybe not the the same sort of free fluidity yet, although he's but that visceral nature, that that ordinary nature that was was succeeding far better than he really had the the, the specific training to succeed. Now look what yeah. Mike Perry's going to do. Perry fights very freely. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like yeah. It's, Perry uh, just yeah. that that desire to fight, that fighting dog aspect of him, that gameness is there. That's all there in John Jones. So, so man, seeing him back will be really great. Now Alexander Gustafson, tough. We've seen it. We've seen it. Daniel Cormier. John Jones, super tough. Also long, also technically good, also mentally good, also highly focused. These guys better be fucking ready to acknowledge what they're facing in each other. Mm. They also better both know, they do, they do, trust me, they do, that both of them are better than they were on the night that they took each other to the limit, right? They're way better. Both of them are better. And if one of them isn't, that will be a difficult thing to overcome. Because then he's going to have to realize we're, more is going to be asked from, from him as a human, as the ability to, to, mm-hmm. to Derek Lewis this and will himself to do it. And it's thing, a scary fight, man. And the thing is, they both fought previously, so they, yeah. one they will know. know right yeah. away. Yes. You know, yeah. They'll identify that instantly. Well, if they remember, it's hard to remember the truth of these things. Like, memories of fights sometimes are flashes and bits then you watch the fight on on tv and then stiff you forge new memories that are not necessarily true like you know but but if they can remember what it was like going into round five um as they get closer to that someone in that fight is even better than they were maybe both probably both fuck it's going to be so good. It's going to be so, so I'm good. I'm just glad we get to see it at the yeah. end of the year. Like yeah, end of the year. Jones yeah. is fighting in 2018. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say there's pretty low chance that I will be on location. It's like hundreds and nine, eight, nine hundred, sometimes $1,500 a night for a hotel in Vegas that weekend. So I don't think any of my employers will be sending me down. And me and Mark can't afford to go. So wherever we are, maybe, maybe we target doing some kind of live stream yeah. during the fights at night. Yeah, we can do a fight companion for yeah. that one. Yeah, we'll do a fight yeah. companion. We'll try to set up a fight companion for that one, the 28th, 7th, 8th, or 9th, whatever it Save is. Elias is free. Yeah, yeah. Elias, if you're free, come and let's do it. I may be, TSN may want me in the studio, but maybe there's a way we can do it. You know, We'll figure it out. But uh, we're running out of time, so I'm sorry all we could do was uh, early preview. Is that what we call it? Early preview? Yeah, early analysis. Early analysis. Uh, and uh, wasn't a lot of analysis outside of me marking out and trying to get a few of the early goalposts in place of what we might see, but we'll go much deeper into that. But next week, we will do a water where we're going to find a couple of interesting topics to examine, true martial arts topics to examine. We're going to... uh, Look at some other fights, some pre- fight previews, but we are also going to, this will give us a little more time to look at um, Habib and Connor and, and the cultural connections to these things. They're, that's that's all real. This, you know, we got countries and politics and religion and, and human behavior and conflict, and these things are all there, and, and they c- shouldn't be overstated. When you're walking down the street, and that's all you're hearing, and I've been staying out of it on a very heavy very intentional way because I'm, I'm about uh, more positivity is better for me and I think for a lot of us and uh, I'm trying to see what I can learn but even just things I'm looped in on on the where people just have my name in some of them have been going on for five six seven Dude. days on Twitter just an argument just reading the, like yeah. the YouTube comments on the videos that we're posting yeah it, it does they don't even care what we're talking about more. no is this an open it's another for place to argue able to argue yeah. about Islam versus yeah. this versus yeah that, versus, which is fighting it's, it's versus this which is politics beyond, versus this yeah, which is country versus this which is yeah um, and a lot of yeah but he did it first yeah but he did it yeah. first even like you know, Connor threw the first punch. It's like, I know if you just joined only for this one, this this piece connects back to something we did earlier on Enjoy the Hostilities on the long form. Um, but that's a that's a crazy that you can cherry pick any one of them to show the ridiculous nature of it. But but going into the fight, there were multiple meetings held by on all sides over and over again that no one will enter that cage. 
They had security there. They, only the fighters and I think whatever one coach was approved or whatever had been approved was in. Everything else was outside. Uh, guards at the. So if somebody's jumping, if 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 you're and I'm not a, I'm on neither side. I, I love both of these. I put Habib up on the front of of my YouTube podcast today because I'm so happy for him and and that fight and that was a wonderful fight. So I'm not on either side. So whichever one it was, if Connor jumped out into the crowd while he was out, so so his guys wouldn't even be coming in to hug him. They're jumping in over the fence when they've been instructed not to come in. You'd assume they were coming to attack you. You'd have to be. Already the first move has been made. This was mandatory. That any one of these on either side, Connor did this, Habib did that, either side everybody is wrong and i promise you that this is so if you if you look back and i know once we add you know all of these volatile things in there it gets harder but but no one you know man you in ireland themselves and this is something that the irish fans and and mcgregor and and his people should see the the battle between protestants and catholics has been going Jesus. on for how many generations yeah. who there's so there's such similarity who and you ask either side, it's like, these guys did this thing that, this uh, long ago. Yeah, and I don't want to be mistaken because I'm probably wrong, but I yeah. think that's even extended out to the IRA versus the Orange Men. Like, all of it. It extends all out of it. to so much more. On all, on all sides, there are good people doing bad things. On all sides, and sorry, you go a step further. On all sides, there are good people doing bad things who believe that the other person caused it. Mm. Uh and the other people are doing bad things because they're sure this guy caused it. And that's always the case. And nobody's correct. There's no Nobody evil. wins. Nobody, Nobody wins. wins. And it's not like somebody is, yeah, but this guy did this. It's like, if you could just release that, if you could just release that and go, whoa, they feel exactly the same way I do. Oh, you suddenly see a brother in them. You see a fellow human being. If somebody spits on you and you can find your way to go and hug them, I swear to you, life will be better. But anyways, if you just joined uh, the the early analysis on John Jones versus, um, versus um, Gustafson, well, then you've seen this going on everywhere, so you know what's happening. But I apologize for for going off on a tangent. But if you've been here for the entire podcast, enjoy the hostilities. I thank you deeply. It is an honor to be able to have a long form podcast where we try to think these complicated things out loud and uh, dare to go into places that will be wrong often in hopes that they'll circle us back to somewhere where we'll be right later. Uh, thank you so much. We'll do one early next week, depending on when you're watching this might be up already, but until then enjoy the hostilities, my friends.